time. If you'll notice, there's no phone number. It's because I don't answer the phone. I, I, I've probably literally not answered my phone in 10 years because all the only calls I get, 99% are spam. Somebody's trying to sell me something, etc. cetera. Um, if you do call, I'll get an email that'll show somebody called. You can leave a voicemail, voice message, and I can click on it, and it'll play it uh, on my computer. If it's a student, I'll call them or email them back, whatever. Usually, I just delete those because there's no message associated with them, again, because it's somebody trying to sell me something. Um, use this email, not the email via D2L, simply because I check this literally about every half an hour during the day. Um, if I don't respond to you, you know, within a few hours, something's probably wrong with me. Um, I never go longer than 24 hours. I think everybody is. Um, so use this email and I will respond uh, very quickly usually, right? Office hours are from 7.30 to 9, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and 7.30 to 8, Tuesday, Thursday, or by appointment. There are some Wednesdays, um, usually about once a month, that I've got to be up here at 11.30 for a departmental meeting so I can meet before then. After then is not as, um, not as good. Uh, but I can, you know, schedule something to um, meet with you if you need to. Okay? Let's see. So... Um, so the texts for this class are two. One thin, cheap one. You can get this for like a buck on Amazon. Don't get it from the bookstore. Fahrenheit 451, you could probably get a bootleg um, PDF version off the internet. Fahrenheit 451, written by Ray Bradbury in 1950. And then Michael Myers, um, uh, Bedford Introduction to Literature, Everywhere you see a little sticky note or something, that is something we will be reading slash discussing. So, yeah, it's pretty important that you get this book. You don't have to get the 10th edition. If you can get a 9th edition, or probably even an 8th edition for a little bit less, that wouldn't be a problem. The only problem it would be for you is I will refer to page numbers in this one. Ninth edition and eighth edition, they're going to have different pagination. Okay, um, I don't know what this is going for used via the bookstore, but it's probably a whole lot more than you can get it for at Amazon. I, mean, I think you can get this for 10 or 15 bucks. I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure you can get it for a lot less via Amazon. And the bookstore is not allowed to buy from Amazon because I've had books for courses that you can get through Amazon that the bookstore cannot literally get. So they've had to say, sorry, we can't get that book for you. So I just told the students to, um, to get it. Okay, so it's those two books. Uh, disclaimer. Syllabus is subject to revision. All changes to assignments. I don't know how well you, you guys can read that. Changes to assignments will be made in class. Let me turn the lights down a little bit. Um, and I will post them on D2L on the announcements page. So if you miss class, don't send me an email and say, what did I miss? Go to the D2L announcements page and you'll see. I also record every class and put it on YouTube. So if you miss class, you can go to the YouTube link, uh, which I will post, and find the class that you missed and you can watch what happened. Okay? What else? Check the D2L email and announcements page daily before class. That is solely in case I have to cancel class for something, okay? For some reason, I'm sick, my wife's sick, whatever, you know, and I've got to, you know, be there. I had to cancel um, one of my classes last fall. I don't know, it was a night class, I think four times. My mother-in-law had a stroke, so, you know, went to the hospital. My wife had something weird happen, and I got a whole bunch of phone calls. I'm like, what the? And I finally answered one, and my daughter was saying, I'm taking mom to the emergency room. So I said, see ya, and no. Uh, but just check the D12 before class. If I've got to cancel for something, 
whether it's me or, you know, if there's a, a weather issue, um, I'll post it, I think I say on there, by 6 o'clock, by 7 a.m. I try to post it about two hours before for the benefit of students who are, you know, coming from Portland or Gallatin or something like that, okay? Students with disabilities, you know who you are. I probably should have already received uh, an email from that office. I haven't for anybody in this class. Um, they should say the third day of class. I'm going to uh, post a slightly revised syllabus later on today. Okay, Cell phones, laptops, tablets, all that kind of stuff. Um, Talk about cell phones first. Use of cell phones for calls, texting, selfies, etc. Strictly prohibited. Should go without saying, right? One of my courses two years ago, in the classroom, two doors, three doors down, there was somebody sitting in that back corner. I'm not picking anybody. Somebody sitting in that back corner, and I'm not kidding, for the first month, every day, for about the first 20 minutes of class, she sat there and did this. And she just did three for like 15 minutes. And I finally said, you know, Jordan or Joshua, whatever her name was, I can't remember. You know, what are you doing? And she said, I'm taking selfies. This angle, this angle, this angle. All these classrooms are alike. What's the difference in the, you know, background? From this angle, I, she, ended up, she eventually dropped the class. So don't use your phones, for especially for selfies. Okay. Doesn't make any sense. Um, if, however, you're a first responder, EMT, fire police, etc., and you're on call or something like that, um, one, let me know. Okay, just let me know immediately. Especially if you're like an EMT, because every now and then I'll have a student, you know, who I don't know has some kind of medical or health condition, and the student will have a seizure in class. Well, I'm not a trained medical I have no idea what to do, right? So it's kind of helpful. Um, but let me know, and I'll just say, keep your phone out, keep it on silent. If it buzzes, <coughs> go out and leave, no problem, okay? Similarly, and this is, this is pretty important. If you have, let's say right now, some kind of ongoing family situation slash emergency, Somebody's in the hospital, somebody's about to go into the hospital, they're going to have surgery, something like that. Um, let me know. Let me know now, okay? If that happens in the course of the semester, say we get into February, and, you know, father, mother, brother, aunt, uncle, whatever, has a heart attack. And it's severe. I mean, you can have real minor heart attacks, you can have major heart attacks. And it's pretty severe. Let me know. You don't have to let me know while it's happening, but let me know within 24 hours because more than likely that's going to affect your performance in class. It's going to affect whether or not you are in class. Okay. But if you let me know immediately, I will do everything I can to help you one, complete the class and two, pass the class. Doesn't mean you're going to get all A's. Doesn't mean I'm going to go soft. But it means I will possibly, here's what I did for one student, say, you can do everything that everybody else in the class does, but you can do it without being here. You can meet me to take quizzes. You can take the exams at another time. Because it might be something where you can no longer come to class. I had one student, you know, who early on, because of some things that happened to her over the summer, this was a fall semester, she developed a fear of groups. I mean, she could not be in a situation like this. And I mean, it was kind of apparent the first couple nights because she was you know, kind of twitching and everything. And she told me about it and I said, just stop coming and We'll work it out. She ended up passing the class. I think she got a C. But she didn't have to withdraw, and she didn't fail. Okay? So let me know immediately. Don't do what somebody did last fall. Email me. Literally, the student did this. 
the last night of class and say, I meant to tell you before, but the reason you haven't seen me since February is because, because at that point it's too late. Okay? Um, you failed at that point. And, and if that happens, I usually, when I have to report midterm grades, I will usually say, you have already failed this course. You should withdraw so it doesn't affect your GPA. Because if you withdraw, it doesn't affect you. It might affect your scholarships. It might affect, you know, hope scholarships, you know, financial decade. I can't control that. That's, that's all in your life, right? So let me know immediately. Um, and if you have the family situation and you can be at class, I will say, keep your phone out. If it rains, I'll know why. I had a student last fall. She let me know early on. Her dad was ill. In like the third night of class, her phone vibrated. She walked out. I heard her burst into tears. I stepped out. Her dad died. Third night of class. Okay? Um, so just let me know and we'll work around. Okay? Laptops. I never used to have this policy, but after last fall, I said, I'm sick and tired of it. I'm done with it. So no laptops, no tablets, for the simple reason that 90% of students who bring them and use them in class are not using them for the class that they are sitting in. How do I know this? Because this classroom, not picking on you guys, but it was like the last two rows back here, everybody had a laptop out, and half of those people had books that weren't the books for this class. I saw nursing textbooks, biology textbooks, chemistry textbooks, aviation textbooks, and they're sitting there. So just not going to let you use them anymore. I'll still let students in my comp courses you know, bring them because for some reason I'm teaching in the classroom that I'm computers. Okay? So don't bring laptops or tablets. Classroom decorum. Decorum just means proper behavior. Okay? Pretty simple. Pretty straightforward. Um, Arrive to class on time. Why? Because arriving late is rude and all that kind of stuff. In the store, if I close it, the door's locked. It, it's auto, always automatically locked. Okay? Um, if you've got a class before this, let's say in the rec center, let me know because more than likely you're not going to be here on time unless you're a fast walker. Most students don't get from the rec center to here in 15 minutes. Um, let me know and I'll even open for a few minutes, but I usually do close the door. Uh, after five to ten minutes, because one thing you'll learn very quickly about me is I'm a pretty animated teacher and I'm pretty loud. And I've had staff and colleagues and secretaries, not from this hallway, but from those hallways, tell me how loud I am. You know, and ask me to close the door. So I do. Um, so if the door's closed, you know, if, if you repeatedly make a habit of coming in late and you don't have a good reason, probably about, about the third or fourth time, I'll just wave. I'm not going to open the door. So you're, you're, get the idea, okay? Um, if I'm talking, please be quiet and or pay attention. If somebody else is talking, obviously, please be quiet and or pay attention. If we're having an argument, like, we probably will when we get to this book. Um, wait for the other person to finish, then blast them. Okay, blast them nicely with courtesy. I mean, don't call people you know names and all that kind of stuff. Um, courtesy stuff, or that kind of what that is. Uh, use language appropriate to the setting. That is, no swear or foul language. I'll be the first to tell you. Every now and then, a damn or hell will slip my mouth. Sometimes. Something a little more colorful, but not usually. Um, don't eat during class. I'm told to say that because for some reason this is a classroom. Students aren't supposed to eat. I don't know why. There's no technology unless you're going to throw it up. And um, I don't care if you eat. But if you eat, don't come in with a big bag of crunchy Cheetos. Sitting right next to the person <laughs> next to you. Because they're going to start twitching. So if you're going to eat... Eat quietly, eat silently. If you're going to drink something, that's fine. Don't slurp it to bother the people next to you. Same with gum, all that. Okay? Don't sleep during class. If you're tired, stay home. 
Because here's what I'll do. It's really effective when the student has his or her head down. Down on oh, table spin. Down on the tabletop. I've had to do that, I think, three years in my 28 years teaching here. Okay? They usually don't fall asleep again after that. Um, I, I'll either literally do that, or depending on when the student falls asleep, like if it's in the first 10, 20 minutes, I might just go and everybody leave. And the student wakes up and like, and they usually don't do it again. Um, Okay, what else? Uh, homework assignments aren't really, uh, oh, sorry, homework assignments for other classes, don't do that in here. I'll, if I notice that you're doing homework for another class, like if you do have a big biology, I'll tell you to stop. Or I might just say, so-and-so, if I remember your name, which probably, odds probably are I won't, um, I'll ask you to leave, okay? Uh, don't wear headphones, earbuds during class. I mean, I understand you're coming outside, you're coming in, you've got them on, that's fine. Take them off when you come in. I, I've had two or three classes where I had a student, again, not picking on anybody, but usually in the back corner, it's, it's where it seems to happen, where they come in and they keep them on and I can hear them up here while I am talking. Okay? Again, I'll tell you to take them out or I'll tell you to leave. Okay? Um, don't really have to worry about the play. Eh, okay, cheating or plagiarizing from another's work. You don't have any. You're not writing any papers in this class. All right, everything's going to be totally objective. Quizzes and exams. So, either you know the material or you don't. There's no BSing. All right. Here's where the cheating or plagiarizing can come into play. I will have a pretty good idea that somebody has copied from somebody else's quiz, let's say, or an exam where you've got to fill in the blank and two people have the same spectacularly wrong answer. I mean, it's like a one in a million that somebody could get be this wrong, but two? And what I'll do is when I hand that back, I'll take those two people out and I'll say, okay, I don't know who, but one of you cheated from the other one. And then I'll let you fight it out out the hallway. Okay, uh, that happens once, you'll get that kind of warning from me. If it happens a second time, I just refer you to the Student Judicial Affairs Office with the evidence I have. I've never been challenged on something like that because it's pretty clear when they're really, really wrong, and two people have the same really, really wrong answer. Somebody's copied from somebody else. Okay. Um, come prepared to participate. This means bring the appropriate text to each class session. That's either going to be this or it's going to be this. <clears throat> Most of the time it's going to be this. I think I've only got four, maybe five days assigned for this. Okay. So that means bring that. And I'm going to take, don't write on the board. I'm going to take this sentence off. I'd added it this semester. I haven't I have not had that in the past because I got fed up last spring teaching this course um, by the number of students who didn't bring their bring a book. And I had a lot of students last fall in other courses who didn't bring a book. So I, I put this in, posted it and everything, and I've just been thinking the last couple of days, you know, I'm not your book nanny. You don't want to bring a book, don't bring a book. It's your money, it's your class, it's your grade. But I'll tell you right now, it's pretty much impossible, impossible to pass this class. Not pass this class well, to pass, that's a D, this class without bringing the book, without taking notes, without paying attention, okay? Again, there's gonna be no BSing through papers. It's, it's either you know whatever it is we've read and discussed or you don't, okay? Um, and there are a copy or two, I don't know how many of this available in the library to check out for two or three hour period, something like that. But again, you can get relatively inexpensive versions um, from Amazon. 
okay? So this is going to be gone, okay? But I'm just strongly encouraging you, get a copy of the book. Any questions so far? Yes? So if we buy that on Amazon, I mean, I assume we're not going to use Black Friday. Um, or would it be best to have it on Friday? We can. Yeah, it'd be best if you could have it by Friday. Uh, Blue Raider might have it, probably does have it cheaper than MTSU. I don't know their policy for buying things from Amazon. Um, lots of times you can get used books from Amazon and you can still get them in a couple of days. Uh, today's Wednesday. If we have a quiz on Friday, I'm not saying we will because I'm going to talk about quizzes in just a moment. If we have a quiz on Friday, the quiz won't be till the end of class. Okay. Um, Quizzes, for the first few times, that is, the first few quizzes you will have will probably be the first two or three will be at the end of class for a couple of reasons. The main one being you don't know what a quiz looks like for this course. Okay? So that'll give you, you know, a little bit of help because we will go over all the material that quiz will be on for those first two or three times. So... We'll talk about all that stuff in class, and I'll say, okay, put everything away, and we'll hand out the quiz. You'll have, I don't know, five to ten minutes to do the quiz. Quiz will be ten to fifteen questions. Each quiz, most quizzes will only be ten questions. Each quiz will probably have five points extra credit. Okay? So, assume for the moment you have a total of ten graded quizzes. That, that will count at the end of the semester. Because I might drop one or two. Okay? But assume you have 10. That means you can have possibly 50 points extra credit possible right there just on those quizzes. And I've had students who have passed this class with, you know, let's say there's a total of 300 points, uh, excuse me, 400 points possible. I've had students pass this with 450 points. I've also had students not pass it at all because they didn't bring a book, they didn't read the material, and they turned in name and a bunch of blanks, okay? That's not trying, by the way. Putting your name down doesn't count as a try. Okay? Um, so if you you know you don't abide by the guidelines, I'll talk to you. If you keep doing it, I'll send you over to student affairs and stuff. Okay. Um, failure to complete any assignment other than daily <clears throat> quizzes doesn't really apply, except you decide not to take the first exam. I actually had a student last spring who thought, I think it was a she, who thought she could pass the course by doing well on the quizzes, because the student did, and she didn't take the second exam. She took the first one, she showed up for the final, but I had informed her, in the meantime, you never took the second exam, you've already failed the course. She kept coming, she took, if you don't do one of the exams, you automatically fail the course, okay? Should be pretty clear. Um, Grading. Semester grade is real easy to figure, for me at least. I take the total number of points you've earned, and I divide that by the total number of points possible. And that gives me a range somewhere here. This doesn't apply to you, right? Because you're not writing any papers. Right? So you get a 89.6. That gets rounded up. you just gone from a B plus to an A. It's not even an A minus. It's just an A. Okay. You earn a 59.6. That's a D minus. You've at least passed the class. Okay? You don't have to take it again unless you want to, etc. Okay? Or any whatever it comes to in between there. All right, the schedule. When reading the material in the textbook, pay special attention to terms, words, phrases, etc. Printed in bold. And I don't know how well it, you can see, but that's in bold. Okay. For example, in the section uh, of the text on plot, which is somewhere in here, here, okay, you will see such terms as plot, exposition, rising action, conflict, foreshadowing, etc. You need to know what those terms mean. Okay. And what we will do on Thursday. We're going you know, to do this section, but I'm going to talk a little bit about these. Not a whole lot. Just a little bit. Why? Because we're not starting 
with fiction. But I've included it here because I do want you to read that because this is only like a total of six or seven pages. Okay? Um, and even in these, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff that you're going to be able to skip, and I'll, I'll tell you what in a moment. Okay? Um, but I want you to, to read over this and to read over this. Okay? So when you see a word in bold, you need to pay special attention to that. You know, maybe highlight it. Maybe if you're one of those really you know, focused students, you, know, you pull out a note card. Right? I don't care what you do and how you do it, but you need to pay attention to those terms. Why? Those are what more than likely are what are going to show up on quizzes. I, I can guarantee you there will be a question that says something like, um, I'm trying to think of one of my quiz questions off the top of my head, but yeah. Blank is the author's arrangement of incidents in a story or drama. Well, that's plot. It's the arrangement of what happens, you know, beginning, middle, end, etc. Okay? So, I mean, those are going to turn. And again, for each section, that is, for fiction, for drama, for poetry, you'll have one of these kinds of big sections. This is reading imaginative literature. I don't know why he uses imaginative literature. What he really means is fiction. Okay? So, reading imaginative literature. Notice we're going to get down to drama. Uh, excuse me. We're going to finish the drama stuff, and then we'll have that again. Why? Because that's when we're going to start reading fiction. Okay? Then we're going to get to poetry, and we're going to have reading about poetry. And you're going to have some terms that are very much the same. Symbol, word choice, etc., etc. Okay? And when we go through each of these big major sections, reading about drama, reading about poetry, reading about... Fiction, I'll tell you things you don't need to know. For example, you know, we'll get to some stuff and I'll say, you don't need to worry about uh, cynic doge, which is a figure of speech. Or, you know, we'll be talking about uh, poetry in meter. I'll say, you don't need to know about, and I'll give you a whole bunch of examples of metrical terms. You know, how many accented, unaccented syllables and how they're arranged in a line. Why? That doesn't change, really, your appreciation, your understanding, your experience of what it is you're reading. Okay? Questions to this point? <clears throat> now, notice for today, go back up. Syllabus, course, introduction, and then I give you the reading, imaginative literature, introduction, fiction, all that kind of stuff. And then I say, watch this video. Okay, now if this were, I don't think it'll work here. No, well, if this were the Word version, and you were using um, a uh, non-Mac version, and you right-clicked on that, it would ask if you want to open it in a new window. And you could open it, and it would take you to, I don't know how long it is, two hours lecture of me going over all the important terms in this section. Right? So I suggest watch this video, because that will then prepare you not only for that stuff, which is going to come up about midway through the semester, but it will also help for this. Why? Because a lot of these same terms are the exact same terms that show up in understanding drama. Okay? Plot, structure, point of view, character, setting. And we'll talk again about quite a bit of that, quite a bit of this on Thursday. We're going to try to also cover these. But in doing that, again, it's going to be restating a lot of this kind of stuff. All right? And then starting next week, right? Yeah, Friday is the last day of this week. Starting uh, Monday of next week, we will do this little bit of background stuff of Shakespeare, and we'll start our first play. Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, first couple of acts. And then we'll have another day for the act three. 
I'm not used to teaching this on a three day week schedule. We might get a little behind, I'm not sure. And then another day for the end of Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, all right? So three days for Midsummer Night's Dream, five days for Hamlet. So we're doing two plays by Shakespeare. Why? Because he's the greatest writer in the English language? No, but because, especially this play, Shakespeare is wrestling with some ideas there that are very, very relevant today. That is, they are universal. They apply to everybody at all times. Okay. Shakespeare wrote Hamlet about 1603. I would argue they apply to people who lived before Shakespeare. For example, um, where is it? Sophocles. That is, Shakespeare's writing about some ideas that Sophocles is also addressing in these two plays. Well, who is Sophocles? He was a Greek guy who lived in around 500 BC. So we're going to be reading two plays by a guy who's been dead for 2,500 years. Why? Well, because the first play, Oedipus the King, also called Oedipus Rex, deals with this whole idea of fate. Can you, can you escape fate or destiny? Are you, is there fate? Do you have any control over your life? A lot of people think they don't have any control over life. They think the man, the system, the establishment, the fill in the blank, controls everything. Well, that's one of the issues this play is dealing with. Why? Have any of you read that before or heard of it? Okay, a few of you have. It's about a guy who hears, discovers, that there is a prophecy made before he is born. And that prophecy was, you are fated, there's that word, you are fated to kill your father and marry and sleep with your mother, and bring children into the world by her. Okay? So his children would also therefore be what? His siblings, his brother and si brothers and sisters, because he brings a bunch. <laughs> All right? Put yourself in his shoes, and you hear that. What do you want to do immediately? No! <laughs> no! One, I don't want, okay, maybe my dad's mean to me every now and then, I do think of killing him. But I don't want to marry my mother. That's disgusting. So he tries to get away from it. And in trying to get away from it, he brings it all to happen. Okay? The whole theme is, can we escape fate or destiny? Do we have free will? Okay. Second play, Antigone, is about his daughter. One of his daughters. He has two. Okay. And that play is entirely about the role of the individual or individuality or individualism, one's conscience, versus the state, the government, law. Okay. There's a law made early on in the play that says her dead brother cannot receive a formal burial. Why? He was a traitor to the state. So, we're going to leave him out for the dogs and birds to eat. She says, like hell, he's my brother. I'm going to bury him. Notice the tension right there. She's appealing to individual conscience. The state says, we have ultimate authority. We have ultimate control. So, when do you decide it's right to disobey a law? I don't mean speeding. Speeding's not a moral law. Speeding's a stupid little judicial thing. This is a moral issue. When do you say, nope, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to pay my taxes. I'm not going to sign up for selective service. I'm not going to go to war. I'm not going to whatever it is the state is demanding of you to do. And you say, my conscience says, right? Pretty important <laughs> today. I mean, we have an impeachment going on that kind of, it, 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 at least to one extreme, was begun kind of by this same idea, the quote-unquote whistleblower. Thought, this is wrong. I've got to stop it. Okay? Whatever one thinks of the impeachment, all that kind of stuff. All right? Then we'll have an exam over all of that.
the exam will mostly be based upon your quizzes. So don't throw them away. After each quiz, I'll hand them back. We'll go over them. I'll give you the right answers, write in the right answers. Keep them. Because the exams, when I say mostly, that means at least 50% of those exams will probably come, if not verbatim from the quizzes, they'll be from the quizzes, maybe slightly reworded. You know. Antigone was a play written by, and you throw in, Sophocles. I might rephrase that. Sophocles wrote two plays. One of them was Oedipus the King, and the other was, and you put in Antigone. Okay? It's the same exact information, just slightly reworded. So most of the exams, again, will come from the quizzes. Okay? Then we do reading imaginative literature again. So this day will really be kind of very, very brief summary so that we can jump into, where is it? Minister's Black Veil, actually, if we're not behind. We might be behind by a day or two at that point. More than likely it will be. Um, and we're going to read two short stories and then this novel. Okay. Short stories, Minister's Black Veil by Nathaniel Hawthorne, famous mid-19th century American uh, bleak author. Oh, yeah. Hawthorne apparently had no joy in his life because everything he writes is just depressing, including this one. It's about secret sin. Um, and then Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find. And when we do O'Connor, I will include a link, or I'll put it up on the D2O website. A link of Flannery O'Connor reading this short story. It's not very long. It's, I don't know, seven to ten pages, something like that. Um, the way she reads it is very humorous. I mean, she makes it sound like it's funny. I don't read it that way, okay? So, you know, we'll go over in class, and then I'll say, I will recommend, you know, listen to how she reads this story, okay? Flannery O'Connor was a Catholic writing in the Deep South in the 40s and 50s. To be a Catholic in the Deep South in the 1940s and 1950s is kind of to be a fish out of water, because there weren't a lot of Catholics in the Deep South then, okay? Um, and a good man is hard to find, I will argue. You know, the title probably is an allusion to one of Jesus' parables. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that. Or if not a parable, an instance that's given in the Gospels, okay? It's about a serial killer. A good man is hard to find. It's about a serial killer. So put those two together. Um, then we'll do Fahrenheit 451. Has anyone read this before? There's a film version of it, a famous 1968 film version. Um, it's also pretty good. Uh, Ray Bradbury wrote this book in 1950. All right? It's about censorship. It is more appropriate today than ever. Why? Because we see censorship almost everywhere we turn. But it's not the kind of censorship that most people normally think of as censorship. Because according to, let's say, the government, the Constitution, where does censorship always begin? Top down. Government. What's the First Amendment guarantee? The right of a free press. That is, the government cannot stop the New York Times from publishing something. Can somebody at the New York Times stop the New York Times from publishing something? Yes, it, yes they can. An editor can say, no, we're not going to publish that. That, strictly speaking, isn't censorship. Okay? Would it be censorship if somebody in this class said, I don't want us to read this book, therefore none of us can read this book. Legally speaking, no, that would not be censorship. Is that censorship, though, in a more broadly configured sense? Yes, it is. Because what's it doing? It's denying each of us the right to read the book if we want to. Some of you might be familiar with the series of books written by J.K. Rowling called Harry Potter and whatever. Well, when those books came out, you had all kinds of people coming out of the woodwork wanting to stop 
other people from reading them because they disagreed with the content. They thought the content was anti-Christian, pro-Satan, occult, you know, all that kind of nonsense. All right? No government ever said, you cannot read this. But all kinds of individuals and individual groups did. They got it banned from libraries. They got it banned from schools. They got it, whatever. It's not the only. The Bible has been banned. The Bible has been taken out of, I don't mean, you know, using in classrooms. I mean, it's been banned, and not for the reason you would think. One of the reasons, for example, the Bible has been removed from school libraries. It supposedly advocates incest. Advocates. That is in support of. No, it includes instances of incest, but that doesn't mean it supports them. Okay? And a variety of other things. Shakespeare has been, you know, banned because of various reasons. So we'll talk about Fahrenheit 451. Notice I've got, what, four, five, six days set aside. Why? It's not a very long book. 180 pages, including the coda and the afterword, okay? which we will read first, actually. Um, but they're very dense pages. I mean, it's going to take us, when we get to... This one page, a couple of pages, in the middle of the book, where one of the characters tells the other character why books became dangerous, etc. It'll probably take us an entire period, maybe two, to talk about some of the issues that Bradbury's raising in 1950. And I'll warn you right now. Some of you might get really offended by what he says, okay? Because he doesn't pull any punches. Everybody gets skewered, okay? Um, if you have a sensitive nature, if you don't like discussing ideas, this might not be the class. You might want to take something else. Uh, I'll just throw that out there. Because there are no sacred cows. In my classes, at least, everything is open for discussion. Everything. Why? I believe in what's called the free marketplace of ideas. That is, the university is the one place in America where all ideas are open for discussion. That doesn't mean, hear me carefully, that doesn't mean all ideas are equal or equally valid. Good ideas, better ideas should defeat worse ideas, bad ideas. Racism, for example, or prejudice, or bigotry, or you know, whatever term you want. To me, bad idea. So defeat it. How do you defeat it? With logic, with reason, with marshalling a good defense against it, or a good, better yet, offense against it. Show why it's wrong. You know, in other words, you can only do that if you listen to the other side and hear the flaws in the arguments, et cetera, et cetera. So there's nothing in here that I'm going to say, ah, we can't talk about that. That's too dangerous, or that's not nice, or that's mean, or that. Nope. But we're not going to, we're not going to, how do I want to put this? We're not going to devolve into name calling, group call, whatever, okay? We're gonna keep it civil level, okay? Then we go to poetry. Why do I put poetry last? How many of you read poems? Yeah, that's what I thought. How many of you listen to poetry? Liars. You're all liars, because not a single person raised a hand. How many of you put on earbuds at some point during the day? Yeah, every one of you. You're probably not just listening to instrumental music. You're probably listening to words accompanying that music, that's poetry. It might be my opinion. It might be bad poetry. It might be good poetry, okay? But it's poetry, okay? So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then we're going to read a bunch of poems, 
And I think I've made this so that we don't have more than, it's kind of hard, um, three, maybe four, no, one, two, three, I think no more than four poems in a single day, okay? And that's just because we only have 55 minutes. And if we have a quiz, the quiz is going to take five to 10 minutes. So that only gives us 45 minutes um, at most. Some days, especially when we get to the poetry section, some days we might leave early. Okay? I don't know how much early. Some of these poems are pretty long. Some of them are really short. And quite a few, several of these poems from April 1st to the end, um, well, maybe we won't. I was going to say, we might cover in talking about these terms, but because we only have 55 minutes also that day, we probably won't. Um, so we'll see. So like, this is a fairly short poem, but this one, I don't know, this one's about 50 or 60 lines. Um, it might take pretty long. This one's 40 or 50 lines. This one is 20 or 30 lines, but it's total nonsense. And so we won't spend much time discussing what is the meaning of Jabberwocky, because it has no meaning, because it is literally nonsense, okay? It's written by the guy who wrote Alice in Wonderland and such. Um, we, we could end up spending the entire day just talking about Acquainted with the Night, or The Road Not Taken. Or stop it, whichever one, okay? So we might get behind. Um, we'll try to cover them all. The final exam is on May 6th from 10 to 12, okay? It'll be in class. It'll, it'll be the exact same format as the previous two exams, okay? It'll only cover poetry. Each exam only covers the material since the previous exam. So the first exam over drama will essentially cover everything from today to that day. There won't be anything from today important on. Um, and then the one over fiction will just cover the terms of fiction, the two short stories, and this. Okay? And anything you know said in class. Okay? Important dates, I don't remember what all those are. Those are various things, you know, when you can withdraw and still get money back and things like that. Um, if you want to with stop it. If you want to withdraw with a grade of W, that's February 17th. All right, so it gives you yeah, not quite a month. Uh, quizzes and exams. It won't be almost every day. Um, I'd say at the very minimum, you can expect one quiz a week. At the most, two quizzes. Probably, it'll be between one a week and one every other day. I won't announce. I won't say, uh, you know, expect a quiz on so-and-so. I would just kind of expect a quiz every day, okay? Be here when the quiz is begun. Yes? So, <clears throat> will the quiz consist of stuff that we're learning in a book as well as what we're reading at the time? Yes, so. yes. Um, what I might do is I might do on Friday a quote-unquote practice quiz. So, over the stuff I signed for tonight, the reading imaginative literature, and the five or six pages on reading drama. So I'll pull out some terms from those pages and give you a quiz. I'll tell you right now, it won't count. All right? But it'll give you an idea of what they look like. Okay? Um, the quiz is usually, like 98% of the time, or 98% of the material, will cover the material you were to have read for that day. So, for example, let's skip this week and jump to next week, which is Monday. Monday, yeah. Monday is the 27th. So, Assume there's a quiz on Monday. It will cover the material on pages 1534 to 45 and or 
the first two acts of Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. Okay, so the 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 pages thirteen, or excuse me, fifteen thirty four to forty five. Those are things about the background of Shakespeare's theater. Okay, you'll have words like I don't know, tiring house. You'll have um, things about Shakespeare's background. You know, who did Shakespeare marry? Could show up because we're told he marries Anne Hathaway, not the modern, but obviously. Okay. Um, you know, an extra credit could be. In what year was Shakespeare born and what year did he die? Might be worth one point, might be worth two points, one for each. By the way, he died on the same day as he was born. Um, you know, in terms of actual play, this will be major stuff. Like, who are the major characters? Name the Duke of Athens. His name is Theseus, by the way. Um, name the man, the character... Hermia loves. It's Lysander. Okay, it'll be stuff like that. Okay, it won't be. Uh, name the fairy that is told to get bottom. You know, I don't know. Cobwebs or something, because they're not important. They don't. They don't cover. They don't add to the overall knowledge, understanding, meaning of the play. But the major characters do. So it could cover major characters, it could cover major plot, it could cover where the play is set. Midsummer Night's Dream is set in two places. It's set in the city of Athens and it's set in a wood outside Athens. So you could have a question. What are the two settings for Midsummer Night's Dream? And I've just told you what they are. Okay? So uh, I'll probably do that on Monday as uh, uh, um, that's the kind of stuff that can show up Monday. For Friday, you, you know. Um, showing and telling are two ways for an author to uh, create what? It's character. Blank is the location, the year, the environment in which a novel or play occurs. Setting is that kind of thing. I already said, you know, blank is the author's arrangement of incidents in a story or play. That's plot. Or it could be plot is, and you fill in the blank. Okay? So, go back down to the bottom for a moment. And we're almost done. Um, yeah, we're definitely almost done. Um, that's all. Because we're out of time. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email. I mean, I've got class right now, so I can't stick around.